Welcome everyone. Today we are going to be talking about the physics of convection as an energy transport mechanism inside stellar atmospheres. I'd like to remind you of our references also listed on the syllabus. There's three main sources that will provide some extra information for today. Carolyn Osley, Modern Intro to Modern Astrophysics, Chapter 10.4, Mao's Chapter 3, Astrophysics in a Nutshell, and LeBlanc, Intro to Stellar Astrophysics, particularly Chapter 5. So let's talk about convection. Inside of a stellar atmosphere, we can usually parameterize stars as one-dimensional entities with radius. So this would be down towards the core, and this would be up towards the atmosphere. Convection is actually one of those things that requires a complex 3D treatment, but today we are going to give um, a useful demonstration in 1D that can hopefully get the key physical concepts across. And so with a stellar atmosphere, this is just meant to show a, some region and then some region slightly higher up. Usually the slightly higher up region, we have a lower temperature, a lower pressure, and a lower density. And that's what these um, d differentials represent. So these are usually actually negative. But we have, we have a different stratifications of, of physical properties inside the stellar atmosphere. And so convection asks, if we consider a cell of material, so in this layer, this is going to have the same temperature, pressure, and density as this layer, so we're just going to grab a little bit of a cell. If this cell was perturbed, let's say upwards, what's going to happen to it? Well, it's, move, it's taking these properties and moving into a new region with slightly different properties. This cell is going to react somehow, and how it reacts determines whether this cell feels a restoring force to go back down, or it has sort of a runaway effect where it feels an additional force to push upwards. And so that's what we're trying to think of today. We're trying to derive some physical conditions that can help us understand those conditions. So you may uh, most likely are familiar with the Archimedes principle, the idea that the buoyant force on an object, such as a boat, for example, is equal to the weight of the water that it displaces. That's why boats made of steel, much denser than water certainly, can actually float. It's because they displace a lot of water. You know, the boats have interior compartments filled with air. That results in a buoyant force on the boat. And so Archimedes principle is at play here too. This, we can think of the cell as displacing some relevant area, uh, nearby medium of the stellar atmosphere. So I'd like you to pause for a moment and try to predict what might be a condition. If we move this cell into here and we want to say that it's going to float, what, how do these properties need to relate? What about the cell needs to be different than the uh, nearby medium? So <laughs> let's, let's add a few more um, variables here. So as this cell moves into this upper layer, it's going to undergo a change. So first, its pressure is going to match that of the surrounding area. This is like a balloon, if you've ever seen a weather balloon launched up into the atmosphere. By the time it gets high up in the atmosphere, it's expanded tremendously. That's because the upper atmosphere has a much lower pressure. And so the balloon has responded to meet the pressure. But its temperature and its density has also responded. And here we're using the differentials of delta as opposed to d, just to help us keep track of whether we're talking about the stellar atmosphere or this cell itself. So now to get a little bit quantitative about this, we need some way to relate these state variables of the gas, temperature, pressure, density. Who can think of some useful formulas from thermal physics that relate these quantities? Yes. You were there, please. Yes, the ideal gas law. Excellent. So the ideal gas law is a very useful formula to remember, usually written like this. We can divide number by volume to get density, and R is just a constant, so we can equivalently write this for our purposes like this. So this is great. This is telling us, this is relating these properties here. Next, we need some relevant uh, understanding of how this cell is going to change as it's moved to this new location. And so let's describe how this might respond. So this cell is transported over a 
you know, usually short distance, short time scale. And over that time scale, we don't really have any heat transfer in or out of the cell. We think of just the cell as responding to its new environment, mainly the, the pressure on the exterior membrane of the cell. And so this type of process, what is this, if anyone remember from thermal physics, when we have a process where we move a gas from one state to another, but we don't add or subtract heat? Yes, adiabatic. Adiabatic. And adiabatic transitions have the property that pressure is proportional to density to the gamma. And gamma is here, this is the adiabatic index. And it's different for different gases. So for an ideal monoatomic gas, gamma is 5 thirds. But for something like air, it might be um, a lower value. And so it depends on the type of, of uh, gas being, being uh, processed. OK, so now that we have some of these formulae, let's revisit the thought question I posed. What might be a criterion for how this cell will respond. Um, will it go down? What will, what will be necessary if it needs to sink? How might the density of this cell compare to the density of the medium if it were to sink? Yes. Yes, that's right. If it's more dense, it's going to sink. It weighs more. It's, it's going to sink. If it is less dense than the surrounding medium, it's going to feel a buoyant force. It's displacing. Um, enough of the surrounding medium that it, it weighs less than that and it feels a buoyant force. And so the condition for convection is that delta rho is less than d rho. And remember, these changes in densities are negative. So what we mean is this cell needs to be rarefying more quickly than the surrounding medium. It's getting less dense faster. And we can... Um, also write this as a relative change to help us um, you know, use these as dimensionless quantities that we don't, we don't need to worry about the units of density necessarily. So our goal, so this is, this is a useful criterion, but what we would really like is an expression in terms of pressure and temperature and possibly the adiabatic index because we want to study this for a bunch of different stars. Um, and it's, more, it's easier to tabulate the quantities of stars using these these uh, properties. So to do this, we're going to do a little bit of, of manipulation of these expressions. We're going to do something called the logarithmic derivative. And it works exactly as described on the tin. So it's first, we're going to take the logarithm of both of these expressions. And here we can use our relationships to turn them into um, negative out, uh, a division into a negative sign. And then we're going to take the derivative, in this case with respect to rho, okay, who can remind me what the derivative with respect to the natural log is? Yes, 1 over rho, right, 1 over rho. And then here, pressure is actually still dependent on rho. So we can do the first step, d on p, d rho, but then we also need to include d p, d rho. This is called implicit differentiation. We can do the same thing for temperature. And actually, because you know, we can turn this proportionality into a constant. We could just say there's an additional constant here that will then go away when we take the derivative. And so we can turn these proportionalities into equalities. And then we can do one little bit of rearranging here. We can bring the d rows over to this side. So as we get d rho over rho equals dp over p minus dt over t. Great. We have, this is excellent, so we have our expression here. Well, that's, that's helpful. But a logarithmic derivative is very useful in astrophysical uh, contexts because it, we, we can phrase quantities in relative terms, right? This is a percentage, d rho over rho, dp over p. Right? These are percentages. And so the units drop out, 
They're very useful for putting together scaling relationships. We can do the same thing over here with the adiabatic index. We get delta rho over rho equals 1 over gamma delta p over p. OK, great. We have delta rho over rho and d rho over rho. So let's put these equations together. And to do that, we get right, we've just taken this component and this component and replaced them here. We can do a little bit of rearranging. So we can get dt is less than gamma minus 1 over gamma over P, DP. And then we can divide both sides by dr, right? These expressions are correct, but what we really might want is a derivative or a gradient with respect to the radius inside the star. We can do that just by dividing both sides by dr. So remember, we said as we're going up in the atmosphere, dt over dr is actually negative. So this is a little bit, we, we can work with this, but it's a little bit hard on the mind to, to use negative quantities in this way. So we can actually flip this around a little bit and take the absolute magnitude of both of these differentials. And then we have our condition for convection. This is called the adiabatic temperature gradient. When the temperature gradient exceeds this here on the right, convection is most likely to occur because this cell, when it moves up to here, has a lower density and then therefore feels a buoyant force and will continue going upwards. So what are the conditions in stars where this might happen? So in stars, uh, where we have a large opacity, so opacity is the sort of mechanism by which radiation is tied to matter. Will a photon interact with this bit of matter or not? When there's high opacity, it's hard for radiative transfer to get out. And there needs to be a large temperature gradient. Um, there needs to be a large temperature gradient for radiative uh, uh, transport to work. And so frequently, it just it gets too much to ask of the stellar atmosphere, and convection will take over. Another place where convection can occur in stars is when ionization is important. This is because when a molecule or uh, when an atom is being ionized, it has an extra degree of freedom, which actually lowers this adiabatic index. And so therefore, this uh, con uh, condition gets easier to exceed. And the final one is rapid energy generation. In, usually inside the interiors of massive stars. So just to wrap up, uh, I'd like to plot these quantities for the sun. Right? We, now that we've derived a criterion, we can look at the sun, the interior of the sun, and help us gain an understanding of why the sun is convective, where it is. So if we were to look at the sun, and we were to plot as a function of radius, so this would be 0, We plot the temperature. We have a temperature profile like that. Pressure, we might have a pressure profile like this. And then we can go and calculate this quantity using these profiles. And then we find that around 0.71 R sun is when this criterion is exceeded. So the material at larger radius from this is unstable to convection, and energy is transported throughout the star generally through convection. Interior, it's usually transported via radi radiation. And interestingly, this type of structure is changes with stellar mass and also location um, on the HR diagram in, in terms of age. So a star of one solar mass, like the sun, it has this radiative core 
and then what we usually describe this as a convective envelope exterior to it. For a low mass star, it might actually be entirely convective. There might be no radiative zone in a low mass star. Whereas for a very high mass star, something that is, let's say, greater than 1.5 times the mass of the sun, this energy transport, uh, this energy generation inside the core can be so vigorous that the temperature gradient becomes extremely high and convection actually occurs in the core and then exterior to that we have a radiative region. And so just to summarize, convection is a means of energy transport within stars. We derived a criterion for when it um, is likely to function when the displacement of a cell of gas is unstable and doesn't feel a restoring force, but instead a runaway buoyant force. And we applied this to the sun's uh, temperature and density profiles. And we looked at a few different stellar masses um, with the understanding that convection, stellar, stellar interiors are different as a function of stellar mass and ultimately age as well. Thank you.